All right. Now, basically, tonight's sermon is going to be almost a continuation from this morning. There's a lot of content I wanted to cover this morning, and I wasn't able to really get to everything. And um, this morning, I preached on uh, how to find a godly spouse, finding the right person. We have a, we've had a lot of single people in service. I, think I thought it would be a good subject to cover. So um, we went over a lot of that this morning. And tonight is going to be a little bit more, I mean, it's, it's still practical. This morning's sermon was practical, but a little bit more hands-on when it comes to, you know, dating practices and things like that. So um, we're going to cover a little bit from this morning, but not very much, and um, kind of get into some principles. Now, when we read the Bible and we determine all of the various things that we do throughout the day, throughout our life, and we make decisions, you know, it's very easy when the Bible is extremely explicit and just says, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. You know, these things, it's like, there's no question, there's no doubt, there's no fuzzy room, there's no gray area. It is extremely clear. But the Bible doesn't go and list off every single possible application of a truth or a principle that just, you know, applies everything. We need to make that application ourselves. Now, most of what I'm going to be preaching tonight is applied scripture. It's applied Bible that there's the truth there and we need to extrapolate that truth to make it fit with our society not, and, and not fit to their standards, but I mean to fit with your actions and things that you do on a regular basis. And especially when it comes to dating, you know, the Bible doesn't give you a handbook of, you know, this is how you take someone out and do, you know, it doesn't give you that, but it gives us plenty of, of principles and guidelines to be able to follow so that we can modify the things that we do to guard ourselves, to protect ourselves from sin, and to make sure we're, we're living an upright life and that we're, we're keeping ourselves as far as possible from committing sin. Because let's face it, you know, when, when you're trying to find a spouse and you start dating somebody, there is temptation that is going to be there. Because you're looking for somebody that you can get married to, and when you start spending time with somebody, you know, especially you start to, to like that person, the, the thoughts, you know, your flesh can start acting up and you're going to want to do things. So I'm going to try to help um, give you some good tips, some good advice, some sound wisdom that you can apply to, to be able to keep yourself pure, to keep yourself moving forward. Now, um, before I even get into some of that, I just want to cover real briefly, and, and I'm just going to make this real clear, okay? What I'm going to say right now is just totally my opinion, but people have asked me before where to meet people, right? Let's say you're, you're an IFB, you're a fundamental Baptist, and you want to marry someone, and, and especially if you heard this morning's sermon, you want to find a godly husband or a godly wife. You say, well, where do I find that? How in the world am I going to find, you know, a godly, a godly husband or a godly wife? Well, obviously church is a, is a great place to start. Um, a good church, especially. And um, there's, there's many ways to meet people. And, but see, I don't think, I don't hold to, you only need to find somebody at church. And let me explain that a little bit. I think another, because there's another good way to, and again, this is my opinion, so take it or leave it for what it is, but a good way to meet people is to go out soul winning. Is it not? I mean, you're knocking on doors, right? You're, you're meeting random people that you meet at any time. Now, obviously, not everyone's going to listen to you, but let's say you find somebody that's kind of in your age group and, you know, might be single, and they listen to you, give the gospel. Well, that's a good opportunity to really start doing the follow-up, okay? <laughs> now, you might not normally be following up with every person you talk to, but they don't know that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and, and honestly, there's nothing, what's wrong with that? I mean, what's wrong with meeting someone just when you're going out and, and working for the Lord and serving God and doing His will, and then just add to that, hey, well, as long as I'm out doing this, you know, there's, there's nothing nefarious or, or weird or wrong about that. If they're willing to talk to you and you talk to them and they give you their, their information and you contact them later, it's still a great opportunity to give them the, the gospel. If they don't get saved at the door, if they do get saved, it's still a great opportunity to try to get them to come to church and everything else, while at the same time getting to know them better and seeing maybe is this even dating material. 
Now, I compare that to because there's, a, you know, and, and look, I, honestly, I don't have like some huge problem with this at all. And I know people have done this and, and it's fine if you want to do this, but going to like, you know, all kinds of different churches. I have a really good friend of mine that lives in Illinois that did this. And, um, and he ended up getting married. So, I mean, praise God, he, he found a really good wife. But one of my concerns with that is when you find someone who's saved but going to a really, really liberal church, but you're like a fundamental Baptist, it oftentimes can be even more difficult to get them to, to kind of come around to, to really see things <laughs> your way because they've just been doing things a certain way for a long time. And um, it, it, it's just, it, it's something to consider and to realize that it's out there that you might run into a lot of difficulties versus, and especially for men finding women, because the men are supposed to be the spiritual leader anyways. When you find someone who's, you know, just brandly new saved, it's like, they're open. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's not all this indoctrination and in, in, in false teachings there. You kind of got a clean slate to work with to help guide them and show them uh, the way. That's, that's kind of how it was with my wife and I. We had known each other previously, but um, after she had gotten saved, she didn't have any false doctrines just embedded in her head. And those are things that can be difficult. But um, churches are still great. Obviously, it's not like you're going to go out to a bar to find a spouse. Right? That's not, that, that is not the place to go to. You're not supposed to be, you shouldn't be going out to the clubs. Those are not, the, that's not the type of person you're looking for. So where do you find these people? Well, church, again, a great place. There's also other things you can do that are hobbies or, you know, some areas that you have, a, you have an interest maybe outside of church. That's just totally normal. Nothing sinful, nothing wrong with it. People enjoy maybe, you know, reading books or going on outdoor adventures or doing, you know, whatever, all kinds of different things that people like to do. Hey, Find someone who has some similar interests and strike up conversations with them. Nothing wrong with that. Completely, completely legit, completely good. So basically, and the bottom line is, you know, we need guys that are going to be a little bit more aggressive these days and, and to kind of seek out the wife because unfortunately, a lot of times, um, it seems like the, the, the ladies have to go a little bit too, uh, get real aggressive into trying to find a man and it's, that's not the way it's supposed to be, but... Um, we, have, we have more ladies here tonight, so I'm not going to harp on that too much. Now, and again, that's my opinion. That's my, you know, th those things, take it or leave it. I'm just trying to help, right? I'm just trying to, to give a little bit of advice. I was single 10 years ago, so um, I know what it's like to, to try to meet people and everything. And it's not always easy, but those are some good ideas for you because you don't want to just revert to doing something, you know, meeting someone in the wrong place, or, you know, kind of going to the wrong area, if you will, like a bar or club or something like that to, to find a spouse because that's not what you're after. But um, just keep in mind if you go to, if you start loosening the churches that you attend to, to try to find someone who might be, you know, a good, a good fit for you that there, you're going to run into issues of, like doctrinal issues and stuff too. So um, just keep that in mind. Now, the purpose of dating, of course, should be to find a spouse. That's why you date. That's why you, you try to get to know people better of the opposite gender, to, to learn about them, to know about them, and see, hey, is this someone that I want to be able to spend the rest of my life with? So you keep that in mind when you're dating people. As I mentioned this morning, you know, one of the requirements in God's word for, for who you should be married to or yoked up with is a believer, someone who's saved. So you, you don't want to get started dating unbelievers. Now, it's one thing to be very casual to try to give someone the gospel because your intention is to get them saved, but don't let it turn. That's different than dating, right? Meeting up for someone for coffee or lunch and your intention is to give them the gospel, maybe someone random that you did meet, is totally different. That is not considered dating. Dating is when you're going to be repeatedly maybe going back to that person and establishing some form of a relationship with them. You don't want to do that with an unbeliever because what can happen and what does happen sometimes is that then you start to build emotional bonds and you're doing so in vain because you know you shouldn't be getting married to an unbeliever anyways and you don't want to make it that much more difficult for you to have to back off and sever ties when you know, you've invested all this time and they just aren't getting saved and it's just like, okay, well, you may end up making a bad choice then and then just end up marrying that person because you feel like you love them. But it, in the end, 
you, the vast majority of time it's not going to work out very well for you at all by marrying an unbeliever unless they actually end up getting saved. So we want to, it's best just to have the rule to say, you know what, I'm only going to date believers. Since I'm only going to marry a believer, I'm only going to date a believer. Now, um, and the purpose I said before is finding a spouse. So keep that in mind when you're dating, when you're, you're considering guys or girls to, to go out on a date with. Since the goal is finding a spouse, you ought to be open about the direction in your life about you know where you're at and and your goals and what you're looking for in the future because if you've got someone on the complete opposite side of the spectrum you don't want to waste your time right i mean that you it, it's a good idea now <laughs> the first date you don't just have to go all completely in like 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 you're almost like you're psychotic about like <laughs> marry me or something you know like and, and going into all these details but get to you know slowly get to know them and, and bring up things that are important to you, right? Like uh, a first date, you ought, you ought to be talking about God. You ought to be talking about some basic things, you know, and, and hopefully that is important to you. I mean, that, that should be number one. You should be finding out where they're at spiritually because that's going to tell you a lot. And that's plenty of stuff to talk about anyways. And I don't care if the world says that's taboo. Hey, the reason why it's taboo is because people get upset about it. The reason why people get upset about these issues is because they mean a lot to people. So why would you want to make a decision based on you're going to marry someone without digging into deep about the things that really matter to that person, right? That's ridiculous. Of course you want to know what really matters to them. So these are things that are a very good idea to bring up and bring up relatively early on because you don't want to, like I said, you want to keep on going and, and establishing more and more of a relationship with somebody if you know it's just not going to work out anyways. I mean, maybe, maybe you would like to have a big family and they don't want to have any kids at all, ever. Those are completely different, <laughs> you know, paths in your life to take and, and it's not going to be very compatible when, when you've got totally opposite. And, and that's something that's really close to people. I mean, wanting to have kids versus not wanting to have kids is, is, is a pretty big deal in your life decisions. So... Things like that are really good. Just be honest with people, bring it up, let them know where you stand and, and try to figure out where they stand on things. It'll save you a lot of problems. It'll help you to find the person that, that you really want to get married to. Now, we started off reading in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and you're probably thinking like, what in the world are we reading Deuteronomy chapter 22 about if you're talking about dating? Because I didn't see anything about dating in there. Well, one of the things that we saw in here and one example I just want to point out briefly is just how valued purity is in scripture and in God's law. And we see that here um, in the latter portion, kind of in the middle of the passage here. We'll, we'll end up rereading it, but God places a high value on purity, on virginity, on, on these things. And, um, you know, maybe you've made mistakes in the past, but don't just say, you know, just because you may have committed a sin before, don't let that drag you down. Just be like, okay, well, what's the use anyways? Now I'm just going to keep on sinning. Don't have that attitude. You, you want to say, okay, this is what the Bible says. I've made this mistake, or maybe you haven't made this mistake, and praise God for that. Either way, you want to try to follow as closely as possible to that standard where God has a purity and hold that in regard very highly. And, and this whole sermon is going to be focusing around this concept of maintaining purity and keeping everything pure and upright when you go out and date people. Because that is the number one problem and, 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 the, and it's a huge problem. It's a huge pitfall. It's worthy of getting at least an entire sermon dedicated to this topic because, you know, today the world treats fornication as not a big deal, as something that everybody does. You know, they're talking about giving contraceptives to children and, you know, even in grammar school and high school, well, they're going to do it anyway, so let's just let it be safe. No, 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 they're not going to do it anyways. No, it doesn't have to be like that. No, if parents were raising their children properly, they wouldn't be doing that. They won't do that. And if we have a proper fear of God in our life, you won't do it either. And that's the truth. And, and the Bible is very, very, very serious about fornication. It is not some minor sin. It's not some little thing that everybody does. Let's, let's get an example here in Deuteronomy 22 of how highly valued virginity is and purity is. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, If any man take a wife 
and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Now it says if I know not a maid, it means I found her not to be a virgin. So the, the example that's being set forth here is that, hey, here's a man, he married someone, he thought that she was a virgin. He thought she's pure. And then, and it's going to deal with a situation where someone just says that versus it actually being the truth, okay? So he's saying, here, here's his accusation. I married her, but she wasn't a virgin when I met her. And I didn't know it. And she was, and, and, and she was presented to me as being chaste, as being virgin, and she wasn't. So verse number 15 says, how to handle this. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. Now, I'm not going to get into detail on what that is, but um, typically this would be something that, that would be received after the wedding, after the consummation of the marriage that proves that the damsel was a virgin at that time and that the, the, the wife's parents hold on to that as proof that, no, you know, our, our daughter was virgin. Verse number 16, And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and shall, they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife, he may not put her away all his days. So there, was, there is no out, to, you know, again, we talked about divorce this morning. There is no cause for divorce here at all, even if he's not pleased with his wife. And the fact that he brings up and tries to tarnish her name, and, and in so doing, what's he doing? He's tarnishing her parents. And what we see here is that the parents, the father especially, is responsible for the purity of their children and especially of their daughters. And fathers need to take this to heart. You know, I take this to heart is that it's no one else's responsibility but your own. If you leave your kids to themselves, they probably will go out and do and commit fornication and to lose their virginity and things like that when you just leave them to do things. That will happen. But when they have a father, when they have parents, that are there to raise them right and to watch over and protect them. Because there are lots of situations that girls can get themselves in, young girls, because they're naive, because they don't completely understand the way things work. They don't completely understand that there are evil guys out there. They don't understand the danger that they might even be putting themselves in because they're young and they still need the protection of their father to, to help watch over a dad that knows, hey, there's a lot of things that go on in this world, and I'm going to make sure that my daughter doesn't fall prey to one of those things. So in maintaining purity, it's a dad's job to make sure that you're not leaving, you're, you're not giving access to your daughter alone with any guy, ever. Never should happen. That's dad's job. And we see here, you know, dad's the one saying, no, 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 she was pure. I made sure. Because look, it's hard work. You got to watch over your kids and make sure that you're instituting whatever rules you need to institute and to be able to monitor your children and say, no, I made sure. There's no way that this could have happened. And I know that, that she was virgin. I know that she was pure. And she was brought up right when this guy just lies about it. And then, and then he had to pay like this big fight. A hundred shekels of silver is not, is not just some small amount either. I can't give you the exact equivalent of that today. But I mean, you just think about like, I mean, that's going to be thousands of dollars easily if you try to convert it in today's monetary system. But, um, but let's continue on here because that's what happens if he's lying about it. But then in verse 20 says, but if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. So the woman that, that did play the whore by giving up her virginity before marriage and her being presented as a virgin at, at a marriage 
and then and then being found out that no, she actually she actually wasn't married. This is you can, you can see how valued purity is, and how valued it should be. And they're saying, you know, this is this is worthy of her losing her life. Let that sink in when people, you know, when everyone else is saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I just had another one night stand. Oh, I, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. This is really serious in God's eyes. If this doesn't demonstrate how serious it is to you, then nothing will. Then you are, you are completely brainwashed by this society, by the movies, by the music, by everything that's being pumped out to try to brainwash you and you're thinking that it's not a big deal. That you can do the most intimate act with somebody else and it's not a big deal. And look, God didn't design that that way either, by the way. When, when Adam and Eve became husband and wife and the two were joined, joined together, the Bible says that they two became one flesh. I mean, that's like them becoming one person. It's, that's how, how serious it is. It's not just some physical act. There's, there's a spiritual aspect to it too where two people come together and are joining in unity. And, and that beautiful act that God has given us Physically, it represents so much more, and it does more, even, you know, even spiritually speaking. And that's something that is only to be reserved for your husband or wife. That is something that, that you ought to, you know, you would do very well, and your marriage will be, I believe, even better to be able to present such a gift to your husband or wife. And this is, this is something that's highly exalted and it's a big, a big, big deal. Now, that being said, when dating, you need to maintain purity. And you say, well, Pastor Burzins, I've already made that mistake and I'm not a virgin. Well, let's follow this example still and not just still continue off in whoredom or being a whoremonger, right? Because that's obviously wrong and it's bad. You can't change what you've already done. You cannot go back and change history. Wish we could, can't do it. But what you can do is move forward now and understand and maybe not be as naive and know what the Bible says and know the truth and say, you know what, I'm still going to exalt purity. I still think it's important and I'm still going to hold myself from this point forward from anything, you know, anyone else. And at least I could say now when I have the knowledge, I'm going to do what's right. And, and that's the best you can do. That's all you can do. So what we don't want to turn if you go to Romans chapter 13. In order to maintain purity, you don't want to make an occasion for your flesh. You don't want to provide an opportunity for you to go too far, for you to then defile yourself and, and commit an act that you normally wouldn't do, that you don't really want to do because you want to do what's right. The way that we prevent those things from happening is not giving occasion to the flesh. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You don't want to give your flesh an opportunity to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know, one of the lusts of the flesh is fornication. So when you go out dating, how, how do we make occasion for the flesh when you're dating someone? Here's, a, here's one very strong way of doing it is by physical contact. Physical contact with another person, the more that you are touching that person, the more your flesh is going to want more. Because obviously, again, you're dating somebody, you're showing interest in that person, and the end goal is you're thinking about marrying that person and being able to have a relationship like that with that person. So this is the course that you're, you're, you're on. You need to make sure in order to maintain purity that you are not providing occasion for the flesh, you're not providing provision for the flesh, and you know, people will call you crazy and weird and I can't believe, like, like what, in, what are you talking about? Because you know, the, the first kiss for kid, you know, it, it's always these big events. I don't care what the world thinks about these things and that, and that you know, kids should be out and making out and kissing and going to these remote lookouts and, and, and doing all these things. It's, oh, well, there's kids having fun. Didn't you do that too as a kid? Look, if, even if I did do that as a kid, it was wrong and wicked and sinful. And it's something I shouldn't have done. 
And it's something that um, is just going to provide for, for more of a, an opportunity for my flesh to just take over and, and get myself into a really serious sin. So no, well, you know what? When you're dating, you ought not to be kissing the other person. You know, there's a reason why. There, it's, there's so many aspects of, of a wedding ceremony these days, a, a Western, call you American, wedding ceremony, that I think the vast majority of people nowadays, the younger people, have no clue or concept at all why these things are done. No, no idea. It's just like, why do they do that? Why do they do that? What do you mean? You want know, to say, you may kiss the bride after the vows are said, after they're married. They're finally married. Say, now you can kiss the bride. Why? Because there was a time when people would follow this really good godly advice of saying, don't kiss them until after you're married. Why? Because by doing that, your flesh is going to want even more. Because there's something intimate about sharing a kiss with somebody. And that's not something you ought to be doing and giving yourself an opportunity to want to do more. Because look, you know, the Bible says that, that you need to take heed lest you fall. We all need to take heed. Because you can't think that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than that. I'm better than that. I'll never commit for you. G, you know, Peter said, though all men forsake thee, I won't forsake you. Right? And you better believe he was serious when he said that. He wasn't, he wasn't just saying that, like, to say it, to sound tough or cool. He actually believed in his heart. I believe that wholeheartedly. He, he fully meant when he told uh, Jesus, hey, I'm never going to forsake you. And he even drew out his sword, but what still ended up happening? He ended up running away. The same thing spiritually can happen to you. You can say, I would, never, I would never commit fornication with someone. Never do it. I know how bad it is. I don't want to do it. Well, you start opening up doors and putting yourself into, into more situations and, and, and allowing for things to happen, I wouldn't be so confident. The flesh is strong. And we need to remember that. Hopefully you've been feeding your spirit and, and you know, your spirit's real strong. But watch out for that flesh because they'll get you. And when you're not paying attention, that's when it, that's when it is going to get up. And, be, and, and you know, so, so not making provision for the flesh. I mentioned kissing, but I'm, I think even like hugging and just doing other touching. Look, if you want to be wise, forsake that. Hold off on that. Just wait. Just wait. Because... You'll have the rest, if this is the right person, you'll have the rest of your life for that anyways. And it's really, really important to maintain the purity. Also, you know, this was in my notes, but there are people that, oftentimes women, the females will, will get um, deceived into thinking that, oh, well, if I, if I don't do this with him, then he's going to leave. If I don't do that, you know, you feel pressured, like, well, if I don't do this, if I don't kiss him, if I don't do this, then he's just going to leave, and, then, you know, and I don't want him to leave because I like this guy, and, and you're going to give in to that. Don't give in to that for two reasons. One, if they're just pushing for you to get physical with them, then that's probably all they want anyways, and they're not going to be marriage material. They're just waiting to break you down and then they can move on to the next person. But number two, if you can demonstrate, no, I am pure with the right person, they'll have even more respect for you to say, nope, I'm not going to do that because I want to be good. I want to be pure. I want to be a virtuous woman. And in, with the right guy, they'll have even more respect and appreciation for that and, and that's, the, you know, that's the right way to go. So don't, don't be deceived. And, and you know, it can happen both ways, but it's probably more common that the guy's trying to, trying to push a physical relationship on a woman than the other way around. So just be aware of that. The more you allow yourself to indulge into your flesh, because that's a temptation, is just, wow, I'm really having a good time here, and you're having emotions, and you're, you, know, you, you feel really close to somebody that you're getting to know, you're dating, and you're going to want to, oh man, I just, I just want to, you know, just give them a big hug or whatever, right? I mean, 
when you start indulging your flesh, you're like, oh man, that feels good. The problem with the flesh is that the flesh is never satisfied. So you start opening the doors, you indulge the flesh. Well, now your flesh wants a little bit more. Just a little, just a little bit, just a little bit more. We know this is how sin works. Just a little bit more. Okay, well, I'll just do a little. Okay. And that little bit more is going to lead you way off track because it's always just a, just a little bit more. And maybe it doesn't happen in one night. Maybe it happens the next, in the next time. And then, oh man, we've, we've seen each other a bunch of times now and you're real comfortable with that person. And now you start breaking some of the rules that you already set up for yourself because you're comfortable with them. But the rules that you set up for yourself are important to, to maintain that period. You know, I'm going to get into those rules in just a minute, what I think are some really good rules to follow. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I just want to, I want to go in a little bit further, though, on this, this not making provision for the flesh by, by withholding touching each other when you're dating somebody in just about all regards. Just, just avoid the physical contact. It's wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. We read this this morning, but we look at it again right now. The Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So he's saying, it's good for you not to even touch a woman. But if you feel like you need to, that's what marriage is for. And, and again, we're talking about dating, so you're already at this point, if you're thinking about dating, that, yeah, I'm going to find a spouse because I want to have this type of relationship. But he says it's good not to touch. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. Actually, you know what? I'll read Proverbs chapter 6 for you. Um, stay in 1 Corinthians because we're going to go to chapter 6. I'm going to read for Proverbs 6 for you. Proverbs 6, verse 24, the Bible says, To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, Neither let her take thee with her eyelids, for by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Now this is this is um, this is the other way around. This is someone who's an adulteress. Guys, watch out! I, I brought this up this morning. The the one that's dressed in the attire of a harlot, the one that's trying to get real fast, real easy, that wants to get you. And what are they gonna do? They're hunting for the precious life. They say there, and, and believe me, there are women out there that are adulteresses like this, and they see it as a challenge. Oh, here's a Christian. Wow, here's someone going to a fundamentalist Baptist church. I bet I could get this guy. I bet I could get him. And then, like, to them, it's a game. It's sport. And, you know, for, for, for a lot of people, it's hard to even understand that there are people out there like that, but there are, and we need to remember that. Just like it's really difficult to understand that there are people out there that are evil and wicked and just want to cause harm to people, and they're up at night literally thinking about how they could cause mischief and how they could hurt people. That's not how people, how we normally are. You don't ever think about that. You probably have never been like that, just thinking, devising plans, how you could hurt somebody. But just because you're not like that and just because most of the people around you aren't like that doesn't mean there aren't anybody out there like that. And we need to be aware of these people. And we need to be aware of the adulteresses and we need to be aware of, the, you know, they might come to you and look very pretty and look very beautiful outwardly and have this outward beauty. But there's lots of things that you can look for. Watch out for the flattery. Guys love to be lifted up and praised, especially from, from a woman. Okay? Guys like that. Guys, watch out for that, though. When someone's going a little bit over the top with the, with the flattery and, the, you know, this woman, a strange woman, just means it's someone that you don't know. I mean, it's not like it's your mom giving you a bunch of praises, right? This, this, is, this is a strange woman that's going to you and, and flattering you with her tongue. And she's, you know, she appears really beautiful outwardly. She's batting her eyes at you. As the Bible says, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. You're saying that's going to destroy you. And this is, this is the power of, of fornication, of how bad it can be and the damage it can cause your life. You say, it's going to bring you to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Verse 27 reads, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Now, what's that saying? It, it's giving you the warning. Don't allow her into your space. You know, I mean, think about the adulterous woman, someone who's, who's out hunting for the precious life, you just, get, you just get close enough to embrace and a hug, bring her into your bosom, and your clothes are going to get burned. You can't bring fire, you can't get that close and not have something happen. 
keep that in mind. Keep the distance. Maintain the distance. Be disciplined. Be self-disciplined to not allow that to happen, even though your flesh might be saying, oh, wow, she's really pretty. I'm going to give her a big hug. You know, just back off. Seriously. I mean, this is, this is, this is going to help you. Verse 28, can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Watch out with the touching. Now, I had you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to see, again, the, the, the severity of, of fornication and, and why it's such a big deal in God's word. Verse number 18, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. Now, that word flee, just think about that for a minute. If you know what that word means, it means to run away, like run really fast. Flee is like, I'm getting out of here, Right? It's not, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. I'll just go do some. No, it's like, he's like, fornication confronts you. You hightail it out of there. You flee. Get out of there. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Say, this is, this is a sin where your body is actually involved. Most sins, you know, I mean, you might do evil to someone else. You might, you know, but this is, this is something against your own body. And verse 19 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. That might help give you a different perspective on, you know, oh, committing fornication is not that big of a deal. You know, go out and having your one night stand and having that physical contact. When you start thinking, you know what, this is, the, I mean, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, like God residing in me is, is, is housed by my body. How holy is God? I mean, how, how seriously should we treat our body if, if this is the vessel, the temple that, that the Holy Ghost is residing in? That's what the Bible is saying. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You're saved. You have the Holy Ghost within you. Walk as such. Treat your body as such. Treat the Holy Ghost with enough respect to say, this temple will not be defiled. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're bought. You, you know, and it, this, is, this is one of the things that the, the, the libertarians or, or anarchists or whatever don't understand with the, with the, the concept of self-ownership. I mean, there's a lot of things. I, I, look, I, I, I love libertarian principles in general when they line up with Scripture. I love, I love freedom. You know, the Bible's talking about freedom. The God's a God of freedom and, and freeing us from bondage and things like that. And, and I'm sorry, this is, a to this is totally just a rabbit trail off on the side, but I, I kind of, I don't think I've really preached on this before. I just want to get this off my chest real quickly because there's this, this, whole, this whole axiom, this, this whole principle of, you own yourself, and that's why you have all these liberties and everything else. Well, according to the Bible, you don't own yourself. So like one of your <laughs> fundamental principles is just totally wrong. God owns you. That's why there are rules. That's why, you know, because people say, oh, you know, that, and that's why they allow, you know, sodomy, homosexuality, and their libertarian principles, because they're saying, well, you own your body. You can do what you want with your body. Well, not if there's a God that owns you. No, you can't. And when there's a God that says you can't do that or else that's worthy of death, guess what? God trumps your little principle of saying, well, I own myself. Yeah, try telling that to God. Try telling that to Jesus Christ who shed his blood on the cross for you and bought and paid the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice for you. Yeah, go ahead and tell him, well, I own myself. No, you don't. You're bought with a price. And remember that when you're out dating and you break your own rules and things start getting hot and heavy and you, know, you ought not to be breaking your rules, but, but you know, keep this in mind. Hey, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to allow this in because my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in me, and I'm going to glorify God, and I'm not going to just trash the temple. So the, I laid the groundwork now, just biblically speaking, for, for where our principles are coming from. Why, why is this so important? Because fornication is so bad. Because fornication is going to bring you to, to a piece of bread. Because fornication can literally destroy your life. 
This is why we make up these rules and we're going to say, you know what? We're not going to kiss. We're not going to hold hands. We're not going to do these things because this is serious. So other things that you can, you could institute rules for yourself to put in place is to go places where there's accountability. Go, go public places. Meet up with people where there's other people around because that's going to be eliminating opportunity for the flesh, right? It, it, these things, you're, you're not going to be committing fornication in a restaurant. You're, you know, you're going to be going, it's, it's times when you're alone, secluded, off somewhere. Now look, maybe there's some really romantic areas to go out and look at the city or whatever, but that's not the place that you should be going on a date. It's just not. Because you're opening up doors avenues, opportunities for something to happen that you don't really want to happen. This is, you know, and, and along similar lines here, I have a rule where I don't give any women a ride when it's just me and that person in my car. I don't, I don't like take them home or do anything like that. I never will do that. I always have to have some other people with me. Now this morning I picked up a lady in our church and I had my daughters with me. I have other people, you know, because there needs to be some accountability. There needs to be someone else there for, well, for multiple reasons, especially for me. I mean, I, I need to be above reproach, so I can't have anyone even suggesting that I've done something, you know, nefarious or adulterous or anything like that. So I'm going to try to keep that. But you know what? Just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean you shouldn't try to hold the same standard for yourself. I mean, I might have more people trying to attack me, but it's still the same concept. You still want to be wise. You still want to, one, not have your name slandered because you're always doing things above board. But two, I'm not above sin. I'm not above the flesh. You know, I mean, I live in this body too and everybody else does. So we make up rules for ourselves. That's why my, my wife doesn't have male friends that she goes out to eat with and everything else and just has these relationships that you could build more emotional relationships with other guys. It's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Not as long as we're married. And vice versa. I'm not going out with ladies at work and going out to lunch and hanging out with them and palling around and doing all this other stuff because it's not healthy. It's not good for your relationship. It's just going to open up doors. You start building that bond, building that relationship, and then you start talking, and then you're having problems at home, right? This is how it happens. You have problems at home. Oh, my wife doesn't love me. My husband doesn't love me. But this person understands me really well. And then you start talking to them more. And, oh, they listen so well. And they understand me so well. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I married the wrong person. And before you know it, divorce, adultery, whatever, you know, life ruined. It happens. This is why we set up rules. Because I love my wife. I love my life. And I don't want it to be destroyed. And this is serious. So when you go out dating, try to maintain rules like this. Keep accountability. Especially, you know, with, with younger kids, with my daughters, they're, when they get to an age where they're going to start dating, they're not going anywhere without a chaperone. Nowhere. Now, I'll, I'll allow them to have some time where I don't have to hear every little detail that's being spoken between them. But guess what? I'm going to be there to make sure that nothing is going to happen to them. Because that is my responsibility. And you better believe my kids are being raised with getting permission for me for everything. When they start getting older and, and they want to go out and do things, they need permission. And uh, anyone that's going to want to date them is going to need to clear it with me. Why? Because it's a big deal. Because their purity is a big deal. Uh, advice for dating, going, going places where you go. Go places where you could talk. And get to know them because again you're trying to find somebody that that is uh, a potential spouse for you so it's not a good idea to go play you know some people go on dates to you know move. i don't recommend going to the movies anyways but that's just a good example of somewhere where everyone's just quiet and you're sitting next to someone and you're watching something you're, you're not getting to know that person at all right or going to some concert or going or whatever like go somewhere where you could actually get to know the person go out to eat Go somewhere public. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do and still, and still have, a, um, you know, have a great time, but you're actually able to hear each other and get to know one another. And um, 
Last place I'll be turned, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I, w there's a lot of adults in the room tonight because, you know, with the dating thing, you could be talking to really younger adults that are still at home and still in their parents' house. That's ideal, right? Ideally, according to scripture, is that you're going to leave father and mother. You're going to leave your own home to go and cleave unto your wife or cleave unto your husband. That is what God's plan is. We live in a sinful world, and that's not the situation that everybody is in. It's just not. And that's not the situation that I was in either. When I got married, you know, I was, um, what was it, 10 years ago? I was 30 years old when I got married. 31. I got to do the math in my head. <laughs> By that age, I was on my own. I had my own place. I was, you know, whatever. That wasn't according to God's plan, according to, you know, scripture. I should have, you know, could have just been still staying at home or just remaining unmarried or whatever. You know, there's, there's, there's you know, I'm not going to go in depth on, on all the mistakes I've made in my life and the things where I went wrong. And, and you know what? People know me and say like, oh, well, Pastor Burzins, you didn't do some of these things that you're suggesting when you were dating. Yeah, I was foolish and I was wrong. Bottom line, it's, it doesn't change what's right. It doesn't change, hey, this is the truth. Because I've made mistakes and done things, and look, I'll acknowledge, I'll be the first one to say, yeah, I did this wrong. And this point that I'm coming up to, especially, I did this wrong, and, I, and I'm not happy to admit it, but I will admit it. When I was dating my wife, there's, you know, the Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. And this is important. Because you have an, a testimony of being a Christian, of being a believer, of being someone who wants to get other people saved. You need to, to try to keep yourself above reproach and not to ruin your testimony. There was a time when we were dating that I allowed my, because I had my own house. I bought a house. I was living by my own, three-bedroom house, you know, doing my own thing. An adult, right, 30 years old or whatever, 29, 30, however old I was at the time, and I allowed her to spend the night at my house because she lived farther away. Wrong. Bad choice. Now, I didn't commit fornication with her, but I opened up all kinds of doors, and the temptation was there, believe me, to, you know, you're inside, you're behind closed doors. Hey, no one else would ever possibly know. That was really foolish and really stupid, and, and thank God that I was able to get away from that without, um, you know, giving in to that temptation. But what if someone were to see her? Hey, they went to Brother Burson's house, or I saw her leaving in the morning. What are you going to think happened? It didn't happen, but you know, th that doesn't matter. Now, what, what, what you're doing is you're destroying your testimony. And you are not abstaining from all appearance of evil. And, that's, and, and you know what? Sometimes people get involved in long-distance relationships and stuff. And go ahead and do that. I mean, that's fine if you want. But don't allow them into your house and, and make that much provision for the blood. It's foolish. It's stupid. And even, you know, someone from that, that did it and was able to not commit fornication, don't do it. Just because that one instance I was able to withhold and my wife was able to withhold doesn't mean that, that you know, that's always going to be the case. And it's a really dumb thing to do. So, so keep that in mind. You know, even if, you know, you want your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you want to spend a night, even if you sleep in separate rooms, don't do it. Don't, that, that is a really, really bad decision. I mean, I'm talking about rules for going out to places in public when you meet up together. The last thing you want to do is have them home at your place, your apartment, your house, when it's just the two of you. Now, if you have a bunch of other friends around or something, yeah, invite them over. You know, you could have a gathering or whatever, play some games, do whatever, and, and, and invite people over. But even then, be careful that it's not everyone leaving. And now it's just you two alone. Don't allow for that to happen. Do whatever it takes so that you're not putting yourself in that position. Now, um, two more points and I'm done. Uh, real brief. I had you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, just, advise, just a couple more tips for dating. 
and I, and, I, and I mentioned this this morning, so I won't really go in depth on it, but ladies, dress modestly when you go out on dates. Don't dress like you're putting yourself up for sale because then, I mean, that's what prostitutes do. They dress like they're putting themselves up for sale because they are for sale. That's not the type of man you're looking to attract. I mean, you don't want to find a man that's interested more in your body than, than in who you are and, 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 you know, want that type of relationship. So, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good, with good works. The most important thing that, that you can bring to the table when you're trying to find a godly husband and you're dating people is your good works. You're, 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 you know, wear, wear that. I know that women care about their appearance, okay, and, and that you should, you know, you want to be well-groomed and well-maintained and, you know, smell nice or whatever, okay? You, you know, the, there's nothing wrong with that, but don't, don't get so focused on that, all the things that you can do to really, you know, attract that guy to be looking at you on the outside because what you really want is someone who's interested in you on the inside and you don't, you don't want anything to distract from that. That's why, that's why the Bible is even going into, you know, like broided hair and gold and pearls and call, you know, all these other things they're all just going to be a distraction. Have the good works. Let that be what's going to win over somebody that you like. Because if they love you for your good works and for your um, virtue, that's who you want. And then on the men, if you want to be successful in finding a wife, okay, this is one tip that... Um, I think as biblical foundations, but again, take it if, or leave it if you want. Show that you can be a provider and pay for the date. <laughs> Whatever you go and do, you go out to dinner. You know, I don't care if it's 2018. Oh, we're going to split the bill. What, are you going to hyphenate your name too when you get married? <laughs> Some people might not even get that. They're like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, you're lost. You, you, you need to get some deprogramming done. <laughs> Go out and pay for the meal. Show, you know, respect the woman. Don't try to instigate things. Open up doors. You know, show them that you care about them. Show them you're interested. You know, ask them questions. Don't just monopolize all the time and, and talk all about yourself and how great you are. You know, guys have a tendency to do that. I don't, don't know. Um, anyways, that's, it's just something that men kind of need to, to be aware of. Be able to... to know more about them and um and yeah and, and show that that hey I, I can be you know this is one attribute and i mentioned a lot more attributes in in what we're looking for i just kind of brought these two up again just as you're dating to to the real practical things that you should be thinking about when you're going to go out on a date what am i going to wear what am i going to look like you know do i have enough money to take this person out <laughs> you better you better right show that you're able to do this you're not trying to, to you know, you, and, and again, you're not looking for someone who's only, you know, a gold digger is only interested in money. But at the same time, it is a very important thing that a woman needs to be looking at that, hey, can this man provide for me? Is this man a hard worker? And is it, I mean, taking me out to dinner, is that going to break the bank for this guy? Because <laughs> getting married, that's, that's not even going to work at all. If, if, if taking me out for a meal is going to break the bank. So, Keep these things in mind. These are tips designed to help you. And, but above all, the most important thing is the fornication. It's that, it's that you really, really, really don't want to get involved with that. And hopefully I can stress that enough so that you can start making the, the appropriate um, changes or whatever to, to the way that you go out and date people so that, so that you're guarding yourself and you're keeping yourself from that sin. Let's borrow as have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the, the great wisdom that we could find in your words. I pray that you would please help us to apply all this great wisdom and instruction to our lives, Lord. I pray that you would please bless those that are trying to find a spouse, that you would help them to find a godly spouse, Lord, that they could spend the rest of their life with. 
And I pray that you would please just um, help the, the parents, the fathers, to guard their children and to watch out when they become, if they're of dating age, to, to be able to monitor their purity and, and to help keep them from that, Lord. And pray that you please give the children wisdom from, from your word that are hearing the preaching tonight that they could um, really hold their purity in high regard and, and to not give that to anybody but their future spouse. And Lord, I pray that you would please just help everyone to be wise in their, their dating habits and, and the things that they do so that they would keep themselves from the sin of fornication. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.